Well, good morning. If you've got your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 9. We'll begin in verse 24. It says this. Do you not know that the runners in a stadium all race, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way to win the prize. Now everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. They do it to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. So I do not run like one who runs aimlessly or box like one beating the air. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Today is uh, Super Bowl Sunday. Two teams have fought hard all year long to be able to play uh, and earn a shot to hoist the Lombardi Trophy, right? Y'all know what they all seen, the Lombardi Trophy. It's a nice trophy named after the uh, great NFL coach, Vince Lombardi. Uh, and some of these athletes, some of these players have uh, really strived their whole career to be able to come to this night, to this moment, uh, to be able to lift that trophy up, hopefully at the end of the night. They've prepared themselves. You know, I think about high school athletes and then college and then all the way in the pros and all the hard work that they put in. But here in this passage of Scripture, Paul tells us about a competition that we as Christians strive to be in. And our competition, our, uh, our prize is much greater than the prize of the Lombardi Trophy. Uh, here in 1 Corinthians, Paul uses some vivid imagery of a go-for-broke minister of the gospel. Someone who is striving, someone who has given up all of the comforts of this world for the sake of the ministry. And he's doing it not for a, uh, a, a perishable trophy or a crown, but for something that is more eternal. Uh, when I read this, I can't help but to see a struggle of athletes here that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians. So I want to talk to you today about running the race to win. Amen? So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll start. Father, I come to you today, Lord, and I just thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, thank you for the, the music, Lord, that we've heard today that brings honor and glory to your name. Lord, we just pray today that uh, we would just open our ears and our hearts and our minds to be receptive to your word. Lord, help me as a preacher to hide behind the cross, Lord, and let your word uh, speak boldly in spirit and in truth here today. Lord, I just pray that everything that we do, everything that I do here today, Lord, will glorify and honor your name above all. All, all else, Lord. I just, uh, Lord, I'm thankful for this church and for the opportunity to be here this morning. And Lord, I just pray again that you'd be pleased with everything done here today. Uh, Lord, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you look at verse 24, I've just got a few things I want to point out here. Uh, Paul here writes about athletes, right? Uh, can, uh, he, running. Now, again, I think I told you all a few weeks ago, if you ever see me running, you better run too. There's a reason I'm running, okay? I don't run for fun. Anybody run for fun? Some people do that. I don't run for fun. There's nothing fun about running to me, okay? Now, some of y'all may think that, but I don't do that. But Paul's talking about athletes running a race. And in verse 24, I want you to remember this if you're taking notes. Paul encourages us to run to win, right? To run to win. Do you know that participation doesn't equal victory? Participation doesn't equal victory. And that's why Paul tells us in verse 24, he says, run to win, right? He says, don't you know that runners in a, in a stadium all race, but only one receives the prize? He says, run in such a way to win the prize. I think a lot of Christians think that we're going to get participation trophies. Well, I showed up to church. Well, I did this. I did that. You know, we need to, we need to run in such a way that we win the race is what Paul says. And you say, how do you win? Well, Paul's going to mention here in a minute, we, we win by setting aside anything that may hinder us from running our race. Now, I'm going to tell you, Paul's biggest challenge is my biggest challenge. It's probably your biggest challenge. The biggest challenge Paul had to running his race and to winning it was Paul. It's the flesh, right? Now, I'm going to tell you, what I tell you, I don't like to run. You know why I don't like to run? Anytime I start running, guess what happens? I get out of breath. And my legs start hurting, my lungs start hurting, right? Now, some of you old guard guys, right, you've been in the guard. Listen, the guard always amazed me. Um, I'm a, I was a younger guy, and I don't smoke or anything like that, but I see these old guys in the guard. Here I am, young, and I can't run. I'm out of air, and they'd be running by me smoking a cigarette, running. You know, they just, it'd be no big deal. And I thought, oh, man, I'm about to die over here. Right? There's nothing about running that's fun to me because my body, my flesh gets in the way. 
And Paul's telling us here, he's encouraging us. He says, you got to run the way, race to, to win the race. A lot of people think just showing up gets you a trophy. And I guess that's something that our society's taught us. But Paul says, I want you to run not just to say that I ran, that I did it, but I want you to run to win. And, and he, he tells us how we win. He says, you set aside any and everything that may hinder you or hinder those to be receptive to the gospel. Right? It means calling upon every ounce of energy. It means putting forth all of your strength to come out on the winning side. Right? To come out on the winning side. You know, in the I'm going to tell you tonight, if you watch the Super Bowl, those guys are going to lay everything on the line. Hopefully, right? That's what the coach wants. That's what their teammates want. You know, in the Christian race, we've got to do the same thing. You know, I'll tell you, there's no place running the Christian race for people who are half-hearted. In fact, Jesus speaks about that, doesn't he? He says, if you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. You see, in the Christian race, there's no room for half-heartedness. And Paul tells us, if you're going to run, run to win, not just participate. The Lord doesn't, listen, God doesn't put you on the team so you sit on the bench, amen? And that's what Paul was saying. Paul was saying, God didn't put me on the team so that I sit on the bench and I'm an idle standby looking at the, at the race going on. I'm just watching people compete. Paul says, no, I'm going to run the race to win the race. He sends us into the game. He calls us by his grace and his salvation. Why does he do that? You say, well, wait a minute, preacher, you're talking about running a race. What race are we running? You know the ultimate goal of Paul? If you look here in Corinthians, you know he's telling this, these Corinthians here at, at this church, he's telling this, he's saying, listen, he said, I've been called to witness. I've been called to share the gospel. Did you know we have that same call today, me and you sitting in this church today? And what Paul tells us is, he says, listen, we don't need half-hearted people doing that. We don't need people who are, who are on, the, on the sidelines. And sadly, I, I, and I'm not picking on anybody, I'm just being honest, in a lot of churches, a lot of people are sitting on the sidelines. We're sitting on the sidelines. And, and Paul says, I want you to run the race, not to, not to just say that you ran, but I want you to run to win. And look what he says. He says, not only that you run to win, he says, why are you running to win? He says, you get a prize. Everybody likes prizes, don't you, right? I love prizes. And Paul says, I'm running to win the prize. He said, every runner runs the race, not to say I ran, but they run the race to say that I won. And he says, Paul says here, I'm running for a prize. He says, I'm running for a prize. I'm running to obtain something. Right? Now, in the context of what Paul's talking about here, what he's really talking about is he's talking about the prize that God has for him as a witness, right? In fact, if you read here in 1 Corinthians here in uh, what Paul's writing about, what he's saying is, is he's saying, God's called me to preach the gospel. God's called me to tell people about Jesus. And I'm going to do that. He said, I'm going to do it not half-heartedly. I'm not going to do it for a participation trophy. He says, I'm going to do it to win. So what are you winning, Paul? I'm winning people for the Lord. I'm going to tell as many people about Jesus that I can. And so Paul says, that's my prize. He says, I'm going to do everything necessary to win people for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, church, that should be our mission and our goal too. We're running a race, right? Some of you think it's the rat race, and it's really not. It's the Christian race. And God's called us to win every soul possible that we can to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I'm running to win a prize. What's the prize he winning? He wants to be the number one soul saver is what he wants to be. He says, and I'm not going to do it half-hearted. I'm not just going to run to run. I'm going to run so that I may win the race. Right? And he says, I'm going to lay aside everything that gets in my way. Right? And so you say, well, well, that's good, Brother Stephen. How do you run the race to win? Well, if you look over in Hebrews chapter 12, we get that example. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us how to run the, race, run the race to win the race. Amen? So we say, well, you say, preacher, he says run to win. How do we do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. We're going to see. Number, look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, it says. Now, I'll tell you something I learned in seminary. You know what? I had a professor tell me if there's a therefore, you need to figure out what. What it's there for, okay? So that's just, that's free chicken. I'm not going to charge you off that day, okay? All right? So if you see it in the Bible, if it says therefore, they're asking you, what's it there for, okay? So check this out. In verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witness surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us, what? Run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, 
the source and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, here in Hebrews, we're told how to run to win, right? Paul says, I'm not running to lose. I'm not running to get a participation trophy. I'm running to win the prize. I want to be a soul winner. I want to tell as many people. I want to be sold out for Jesus is what Paul says. I want to get, be completely bought in. I don't want to be half-hearted. I don't want to sit on the bench. I want to be involved. And he says, this is how you do it. Hebrews tells us, number one, it says, lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us. You know what keeps a lot of people from doing what's called, what God's called them to do in the church? It's our sin. All right? And Hebrews tells us to take that sin, to take those things that would, that would pull our flesh back. Remember I told you Paul deals with the flesh a lot. And Paul says, my flesh is my biggest enemy. And if we're being real honest, our flesh is our biggest enemy. And what keeps us from doing what God's called us to do, i.e. running the race, is itself. And it's sin. And so here in Hebrews it says we're to lay aside, we're to repent, we're to renounce that sin because it's that sin that's holding us back. Right? God's called you to do something in this church. Y'all know that? God's called all of you to do something. Some of you may be doing music. They did a great job, didn't they? Some of you may be a greeter. Some of you may be a Sunday school teacher. God's called you to do something. He's called all of us to tell, to tell and to share the gospel to a lost world. And so Paul says, I'm going to be sold out. I'm going to be all in for Jesus. I'm not going to be half-hearted. He says, I'm going to run the, what, the race to win. I'm going to run it to win. And so in Hebrews, it tells us how we do that. The first thing we've got to do is we have to set aside anything, any sin, any hindrance that could hold us back. Number two, Hebrews tells us that we need to do this. It says to run with endurance. You see, I'm not a runner. I've told you that. But one of the things when I first joined the military, I could run. Y'all are not going to believe this. So when I was at AIT, I was at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And it was in the wintertime, so that was a good thing, right? Now, if you go in the summertime, it's hot. If y'all been to Columbia, South Carolina, in like June or July, it's hot there, okay? And so I was in the winter, and they told us this. You know what they told us? If you don't pass this last PT test, we're going to recycle you. you got to start this whole thing all over again, right? Now, I had a real nice-looking lady at home waiting on me, right? We were writing letters back and forth. And the thought of me spending 10 more weeks in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, I didn't want to do that. So they took us out to this field, it's a PT track, and what they do is you have to run three laps equals two miles, right? That's a, lot, that's a long way. And so here's what I decided I was going to do. I was going to pass every person in front of me, right? And so I started running these three laps, and every time I'd see somebody in front of me, I'd pass them. And then I'd see the next person, I'd pass them. Now this is where y'all are not going to believe me, because I know from this physique it may, you know, it may cloud your imagery of me. You know, when I crossed the finish line, you know how much? I ran two miles in 15 minutes and 3 seconds. That's the fastest I ever ran. Man, that was amazing. Now, if I did that now, my heart would explode, okay? <laughs> but, you know, I think about how I got there. Well, I didn't just start running that day. You know, how did I get there? Well, when you first get to basic training, when I went to Fort Benning, that old drill sergeant made me run everywhere I went. And then every, everywhere I went, I kept running. And we'd have days where we run miles at a time. And in Fort Benning, they got these hills that you run, and I hated those hills. And you know, it was a, it, it, what I'm trying to get to is this. I didn't just show up and start running. And that's not what the Christian race is. That's not what, what Paul's asking us to do. He says, run with endurance the race set before us. A lot of people think that the Christian race is a sprint, and it's not. It's a marathon. That's why some of you older folks should be better at it than us, right? Uh-oh. Yeah, I'm talking to y'all, all you gray-haired folks out there, right? Or you no-haired folks out there. Y'all ought to be better Christians. You ought to be more advanced in your faith. You ought to be running better than me. Why? Because you've been doing it longer. And so Paul says we run with endurance. You take off running this Christian race, and it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Are there going to be some days you have setbacks? Absolutely. Are there going to be some days you have failures? Absolutely. Some days you're going to get up and not want to run. That's how it works. But listen, the Christian faith is a marathon. It's not a sprint. You see, we have, to, we have to be determined to get up every day and to live the life that Christ has called us to live. And some days you're not going to do as well as others. But that's okay because that's why I say that it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's the Christian life, the Christian walk is a process where God molds and makes us each and every day into being more like Him. Amen?
And some people think that you have to arrive all of a sudden. That's not what it's like. It's growth, right? God wants us to grow each and every day to be more like Him. That's why I say that the Christian race is like a marathon, not a sprint, right? And so uh, Hebrews says that we need to lay aside all the things that hinder us. Hebrews says we need to run with endurance. But he also says, look in Hebrews, he says we need to look unto who? Look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, you remember I told you when I was running at Fort Jackson, when I would pass somebody, I would lock on to the next person in front of me. And when I got to that person, I'd lock on to the person in front of me again. And then by the time those three laps were up, I had already crossed the finish line. I wasn't focused on my legs hurting. I wasn't focused on the fact that I couldn't breathe. I was focused on getting to that next person. And Hebrews says if we want to finish the race, if we want to win, we have to look to who? Jesus. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Listen, you are on this Christian life now because Jesus put you there. Because he saved you. He put you in the spot you're in. And the great thing about the Lord Jesus Christ is if he puts you on the path where you're at, where you're at guess what he'll do? He'll finish it. He'll finish it. That's why he says the, he's the author and the perfecter of our faith. And so when we're running this Christian life, right, when we're running this marathon that we call the Christian life, where do we keep our focus? Well, we don't keep it, our focus on the things happening around us. We keep our focus on Jesus. We keep our eyes on Christ, right? Y'all remember the, 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 the story in, in Scripture where you remember the event where all the disciples are on a boat? Y'all remember that? And a storm hits, all right? Y'all know that this is yes, this is no. Some of y'all are just ready to go eat stew, okay? I got you. Me too. Well, you know, I think about Peter when he got out of the boat. Right? You know what did Peter do? He locked his eyes on Jesus. And you know there's only two people in recorded scripture ever walked on water and who it was? Jesus and Peter. And what happened to Peter? When he kept his eyes on Jesus, what happened? He walked on water. But what happened to Peter? When the, when the wind started to howl and the lightning started to crash and the thunder started to boom, he looked away. And he took his focus off of Christ and he put it on the, 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 the situation around him. He, on the problems he was encountering. What happened? As soon as he did that, what happened to Peter? He started to sink, right? You know, there's a great image in that as a runner, right? If we're running this Christian life, if we're running this Christian race, we're to keep our, our focus on Christ. When we start to take our eyes off of Christ, when we start to focus on other things in our life and our problems and our situations and our circumstances and all the stuff that really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, we start to slow down. We start to stumble and to fall. So here Hebrews says if we want to keep running the race to win, we have to keep our focus on Jesus. Jesus is the finish line, church, and we need to keep our focus there on Him. And so Hebrews tells us how we win the race. You lay aside everything that may hinder you. He said all that sin that bogs you down and weighs you down, get rid of it. Run with endurance, right? Remember, this is not a sprint, church. The Christian life, the Christian race that we're running it takes time, and each day the goal is to get better than the day before. But remember to keep your focus while you're running on Jesus. If you take your eyes off the prize, you'll surely lose. Amen? And so Hebrews tells us how to win. So we see that we run to win. Number two, we train to win. We run to win, but we train to win. Look at verse 25. It says back there in uh, 1 Corinthians. Look at verse 25. Now everyone who competes... Uh, exercises self-control in everything, right? Everyone who competes, right, they exercise self-control in everything. In order to win, you got to put in the work, right? These guys who are playing tonight, they've been working their whole lives to get there, okay? And you know, really, I'm going to give you all something. So, you know, Paul's actually writing in the context here of an event. Now, you all know the Olympics, right? You all know the Olympics. You know, if you win the Olympics, you get medals, right? First place gets a what medal? A gold, second place, third place, right? So in Paul's day, they had games. I'm on, I've been, if y'all were saw me, I've been saying this all morning so I don't mess it up because I'll mess it up. The Isthmian Games, all right? Corinth is an isthmus. And what they would do is at Corinth, they would have these games where Greek people would come all over and they would compete in like an Olympics. Now, this, this is going to boggle me. It boggles my mind, so it'll boggle your mind. They do things like running. They do boxing javelin throwing, and you know what else they do? Poetry reading. I never thought about poetry being an Olympic game, but they did. They would sing and they would do poetry. But these games, where they would gather around Corinth, and, and, and they gathered around, of course, the Greeks, you know, worshiped different gods, and they gathered around the Greek god Poseidon. And what they would do is they would, these, these athletes, 
They would train for 10 months at a time. In fact, they took an oath. Y'all know an oath, right? They would take an oath that they would commit themselves to train for 10 months. And they would show up in Corinth, and they would do these Ismothian games, and they would compete. Now, you know what they competed for? They competed for a crown. Now, in that time, the Greeks liked to use celery, right? Now, think about that, celery, a celery branch. And the Romans liked to use pine branches. And so when you won, you got a crown. There wasn't no first, there wasn't no second and third. You either won or you didn't. And so Paul was in Corinth during the time they were having these Ithmus, Ismothean games, okay? And so you had all these athletes there. And now, and guess this. Uh, I was looking, I was reading, uh, guess what happened? So they're all converged on this, Cor- this city of Corinth. And there was really no, they didn't have like a Holiday Inn Express down the street, right? They didn't have a big Olympic complex that they trained in. And so these people would have had, and, and this is where I thought was crazy, uh, they would have been. Uh, they would have had popped up these little tents all around the training areas, and that's where they would have lived. Now, why do I say that? What was Paul's profession? He was a tent maker. So, guess what Paul would have been there doing? He'd have been there fixing, repairing, setting up tents for these guys. But guess what else Paul was doing while he was there? He uses an opportunity to do what? To share the gospel with these folks. And so Paul is in the middle of these guys training and practicing and these games going on. And so Paul's there, and this is when he writes this. He says, everyone who competes exercises self-control. These guys had committed their lives 10 months to train. They took an oath. We will go out and we'll beat our bodies black and blue so we can win the crown, right? And what were they fighting for? A crown of celery. A crown of pine. Guess what happens after a while to that crown? It rots. It goes away. And that's why Paul, he comes in, guess what he says? He says, he says, I'm striving for what? An imperishable crown. And so he's looking at these guys training. And he says, this is what I need to do. He says, uh, he says they have to control their flesh. Right? You know, after you, and I'm not an athlete, clearly, right? You can tell I'm not an athlete. But I remember when I played football, we had to watch what we eat. Right? Now, I remember, now, y'all know Doug Argo, don't you? Right? Y'all know Doug Argo? He was my football coach in high school. I loved Doug. He's got a scar on his chin. You know who put it there? I put that scar there, right? I'll tell you that's another story for another time, okay? But uh, I remember Coach Argo, uh, and those, they, would, we'd be, they would give us all those powders and stuff. You know, I can remember going into weightlifting, and we dumb. I, just, I look back and how dumb I was. We'd take that creatine powder, and I'd put it in my mouth and drink the water fountain. We'd go in there and lift weight. You had to be committed. You know, you just can't, athletes just don't eat what they want to eat. They just don't. Or they just don't lay in the bed all day like I want to do and watch TV. Athletes have to condition their bodies. It takes self-discipline to be an athlete. And these guys who are competing in these Ismothian games, they were self-disciplined, right? They had gotten their bodies under their control. And this is what Paul is saying here about himself. He said, if I want to win the race, I have to bring my body under control. Now, Paul, what he talks about all the time is the flesh. Right? And what he's really talking about is his sin nature. You know, wasn't it Paul who said, man, the things that I really should do, I don't do. The things I want to, I don't think about doing. And so Paul struggled with this. And as a, listen, as a Christian athlete, because that's what you are if you're sitting in church today, you're a Christian athlete, you have to keep, and I have to keep my body under self-control. So listen, my flesh wants to do a lot of things. But if I want to be uh, someone who wins the race for Jesus, who keeps my eye on the prize... I've got to bring my body, my flesh, under self-control. And so Paul says, you just don't go out there run. You've got to train. You've got to train to win. You know, agony and agonize are words that describe extreme suffering that's mental and physical. And Paul encourages us to put our bodies through agony. Right? My flesh wants to do so much more. And Paul says, we've got to rein that in. We've got to get that under control. And so Paul is constantly talking about these athletes who... Who, who, who put themselves under self-control. But, you know, I was thinking about that, that whole word self-control. And I really don't like that word. You know why? Because self-control implies what? That in order to control my flesh, guess who has to do that? That's a question. Y'all can answer that, okay? It means I have to do that. Listen, I don't trust me. And so what do I have to do as a Christian? Well, do what Paul said. Paul said that you have to allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through you, right? If you left it up to Stephen to control himself, that ain't going to work too well. You me tell you how I know I don't have any self-control? You know what the Girl Scouts just got done selling? You know what my favorite Girl Scout cookie is? 
thin mints. I will tell my wife I'm going to eat a couple thin mints. And I look up and guess what? I've eaten two sleeves of thin mints. Right? That's how I know Stephen doesn't have any self-control. Right? Stephen doesn't have any self-control. And so when we're talking about Paul, talking about training ourselves, we're really allowing the Holy Spirit of God to move and to work in and through us. I don't rely on self to resist temptation. You know who I rely on? The Holy Spirit of God. Because that's what's going to get me through. Right? If I had self-control, I'd be in trouble. But I have Holy Spirit control. And that's what Paul urges us to do. Paul says, you've got to train yourself. Rely on the Holy Spirit so that when your flesh starts to get weak and wants to do those things that you shouldn't do, that takes you off your task, that takes you off your mission, you restrain yourself. You get your body back under your control. Paul, uh, wants to, Paul wants us to know that I have my body under control. It's not the other way around. My body doesn't control me. Right? My flesh doesn't control me. I control it. And so Paul says, I want to train to win. Right? How do you do that? Well, you stay focused on Jesus. You rely on the Holy Spirit. But there's something else that Paul says here. I think this is cool. Look at verse 26 and 27. He says, uh, in verse 26, he says, So I do not run like one who runs aimlessly or box like one beating the air. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Paul says, I don't want to be disqualified from winning. And he says, if we're going to run to win, if we're going to train to win, he says, I want to aim to win, right? Now, y'all like boxing, don't you? Y'all ever seen boxing, right? Boxing. And so he, he gives this analogy. He says, I don't box with no aim in sight, right? Think about a boxer in a boxing ring. He just went in and just started punching wildly in the boxing ring. What would happen? He'd get knocked out. That's exactly what happened to him, right? And so Paul says, I don't box aimlessly. I don't run for nothing. He says, I have something in mind. He said, I want to make sure that when I throw a punch, all of them land where I want them to. Uh-oh. So Paul says, all this training I'm doing... He says, has a purpose. Paul wanted to make sure that everything he did had, was, was tied into those aims and goals that God wanted. And what was he trying to do? He's trying to win souls for the Lord, right? He's trying to share the gospel with all these people. And he says, everything I do, every action I take, every decision, every step is going to be on purpose. It's a purposeful action is what Paul says. I'm not just going to go out there like a boxer slinging my arms wildly in the box. He says, I'm going to make sure that I land every punch where I want to land it. And so he had aims, he had goals, he had purposes. He says, I want to finish and I want to win the race. I want to be someone who's under self-control. I want to be someone who controls my body and not the other way around. Why? Because he says, I want to be an effective minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In church, we ought to be the same way. You see, sometimes I feel like we as Christians, we just have to run. And we're like that, like that, that hamster on the wheel. Right? We just run and we don't know what we're running for. And we need to train ours. We need to have purpose in our life. And what's that purpose? Well, each and every one of you sitting there looking at me, you know you've got a purpose. You know what it is? To share the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Some of you have families at home. That's your first mission field right there. If you've got kids, guess what? You're a missionary. You're supposed to win your kids to Christ. So I don't have kids anymore. I've got grandkids. Congratulations. Your job is to win your grandkids to Christ. So I don't have any grandkids. Well, it's when your coworkers, it's to win your neighbors, it's to win whoever that you come into contact with, the checkout lady at the grocery store, whomever. And Paul says, that's my goal. Paul says, I want to be the best soul winner there is. And I'm going to take myself out of the equation. So he says, everything, every punch I throw, I got an aim for it. it I want it to land and I want it to hit. And so Paul, Paul says, every punch was meaningful. Paul lived so that everything that he did impacted eternity. Let me say that one more time. Paul lived so that everything he did had an impact on eternity. And that should be our goal as Christians. That every action, everything that we do has an impact on eternity. Because Paul said, I'm competing for a prize. What's that prize? It's an imperishable crown, he says. And so everything we do as Christians ought to be the impact eternity. And he didn't want to let his body, he didn't want to let, uh, he didn't want to let his body get in the way. In fact, Paul here says, he says, I beat my body black and blue. I whipped myself into shape. I took away all those things I shouldn't do. Why? Because I want everything, I want, when people look at me, I want them to know that I am focused on Jesus and I am focused on eternal things. Right? That's why Jesus says what? Seek ye first what? The kingdom. Listen, church, if you're looking at me and hearing me today, 
If you're here for anything but the kingdom, you're wrong. If you're out there like Paul says, a boxer just wailing at somebody in the boxing ring hoping that a punch lands, right, you're wrong. Every decision, every action, everything that you and I do should be purposeful to advance the kingdom. Everything we do is eternal. And so look what Paul closes with here. He says, what do we win? What do we win? Look at verse 24 and 25 again. Do you not know that runners in the stadium all race, but only one receives a prize? Run in such a way to win the prize. Now everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. They do it to receive a perishable crown. But we, an imperishable crown. You see, when we're thinking about, well, preacher, all, all this stuff you're saying is good, that we should self-discipline ourselves, we should beat ourselves into shape so that our flesh isn't winning, that we control it, not the other way around. That we should be doing everything, all our actions should be aimed for a purpose, which is the kingdom. That everything we're doing should be to point others to Jesus Christ. But what is in it for me? Well, Paul answers that. Paul says, you get an imperishable crown. He says, I'm competing for a prize, right? What's he competing for? Well, if you look at the context here, Paul said what? I want to win as many people for Jesus as I can. Is there any other prize greater than that? Think about this. One day you're going to be walking in heaven and you're going to see tons of people that guess what? You played a part in them coming to have faith in Christ. In and isn't that going to be awesome? You think about that. I know there are people in my life, when they see me, they're going to be real surprised. And I hope they say the same thing. Wow, I had a part in that. You know, we don't save anybody. But God is so good that he gives us an opportunity to be a part of the process to point people to Jesus. And I don't know of any greater reward than one day to stand in the streets of glory and to look around and think, wow, I invited that guy to a Bible study and he accepted the Lord. Wow, I taught vacation Bible school and that little kid gave their heart to Jesus. What, any, what greater reward do we need than that, church? Nothing. But, you know, I think Paul goes on. You know, that crown in heaven, that, that reward, that imperishable he gets, not only is it going to be people, not only is it going to be people who we see in heaven, who we had a part, that God allowed us to have a part in winning for him, but guess what? You know what the biggest prize of all in heaven? You know what it's going to be? Jesus. I tell people all the time. You know what I'm going to be so excited about? Going to see Jesus. That's the greatest reward of all. Right? We, listen, I, I've read about Christ, and I know how wonderful he is according to the scripture, but listen, I can't wait one day to see him face to face, to fall before my Savior's feet and to worship him. Wow! What a prize, church! And if we get to do that, and think about this, are you ready? How much more awesome is it going to be when Jesus looks at us and says, thank you for being faithful to me. Thank you for running the race to win it and not just to be a participant. How much more awesome will that be? But you know, I think something else about that prize. I think something else that Jesus obviously is the greater prize. But you know, I think about the opportunity that we have here to be a blessing to others. Alright? Everything I'm doing, hopefully, is for an imperishable crown. Those athletes in Corinth, they were competing, beating themselves up to win a crown of celery. <laughs> think about that. And Paul says, I'm winning... I'm winning a prize that'll last forever. What you do for the Lord, church, is imperishable. And you may never see the results or the reward in your lifetime, but the work that you do, the work that you do for the Lord is invaluable, imperishable, and it'll last forever. I think about the people in my life who had something to do. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for one person who said, I'm going to run the race to win it. I got a best, my, one of my best friends. Y'all know who he is, Adam Robinson. Y'all know Adam? He said he speak here for Adam and Krista. Adam and I were in school together, and uh, we used to pick on each other. And uh, Adam and his dad went to First Baptist Dyer, and Adam invited me every day. Every day they invited me to come to church. And I'd keep telling him, no, I, don't, I can't do that. And so it was a men's dinner. Adam said, Stephen, uh, my dad and I will buy you a ticket for a steak dinner. You show up. And I thought, steak dinner, I'm in, you know. And, uh, well, the day of the steak dinner was a Wednesday night. The day of the steak dinner got there. And uh, I came up with some excuse during the school day why I couldn't go. And I'll never forget, he looked at me. And you know how to look at little puppy looks after you whip him or something like that? He looked what he looked like. 
I said, Adam, I can't go, man. And he, he just looked at me and he said, but my dad and I already paid for the ticket. Oh, man, I felt horrible. Well, I went. And you know, if it wasn't for my friend who had eternity on his mind, who was running the race to win the prize, I wouldn't be standing here. You know why? Because I went to church that night. I don't even know who the preacher's name was. I don't know what verse he used, but you know what I remember? I remember him looking at me, and I was the only person sitting in the pew. And you know what he told me? He said, you're a sinner. And he told me about all the great, wonderful things that Christ did for me. And then he said something that stuck with me forever. He said, if you were the only person that God ever created and you still failed, Jesus would still come for you and save just you. And there I was, a tough football player, Matt. And I just started sobbing in my pew. Tears rolling down my face. And they gave the invitation. And they said, you come down. And I stepped, he said, actually the preacher said, you grab your buddy if you got a buddy. And I thought, well, if that ain't the Lord talking to me, I don't know what is. So I nudged Adam. Y'all ready? I looked out and I was standing in that aisle and he didn't feel me nudge him, so I was by myself. I walked down that aisle and I gave my life to Christ. Now, it hadn't been, it's been a bumpy road. I'm sure everybody could say that. But I think about Adam. You know what Adam's doing now? He's a missionary. He and his wife have given up a comfy life here in America. Right? And they have served the Lord somewhere else. I can't tell you where, but they serve the Lord somewhere else. You know why? Because Adam, he wants to run the way, race to win. He's not worried about a crown here. He's worried about an imperishable crown. And I know that there are parts of him that he has to fight the flesh to say, I don't want to do that. But he's serving the Lord. You know, I, I want to be so surrendered that I can do that. And you know, when we talk about athletes and we talk about these games, you know, the Lombardi Trophy is awesome. But I'm going to tell you, the reward that the Lord has is much greater than any Lombardi Trophy you'll ever live. I saw somebody posted earlier in the week, and I'm glad y'all didn't do this. It said, you really want to surprise your pastor? After the end of the sermon, tell him a great job and dump it, give him a Gatorade bath, right? You know, dump the Gatorade on him like they do the coaches that went afterward. I'm glad y'all didn't decide to do that. But that's the kind of life I want to live, where I'm so sold out for the Lord that I'm not thinking about the here and the now. I'm thinking about the kingdom and that all my actions are focused toward him. So I want to live in such a way that I can tell as many people about Jesus as possible. That's what Paul said. Paul said, this is what I want. I want to be a great minister of the gospel. I want to tell as many people as I can about Jesus. What about you? Are you sold out today? Let me ask you this, church. Are you sitting on the bench or are you running a race? God's called you to do something. Whether it's to teach a Sunday school, to lead a musical, to sing a musical. Right? God's called you to do something. Maybe it's to cook. Maybe it's to teach. There may be a preacher in here. But you know, you'll never win the race sitting on the sideline. I don't do this for me. Right? I do this because I love the Lord. I look at all the, I, I go and I, I get the fun, I get the most fun job of all. You know, in the mornings I get to go see Sunday school teachers and what they do. And you know, all those teachers, when I go see them, they're not doing it for them. Because you know, they don't get paid anything for it. They're not doing it. Listen, I go to that nursery, those nurse workers don't get paid for that. You know why they're doing it? Because they're focused on an eternal reward. They're focused on an imperishable crown. What about you today? What are you focused on? Are you just sitting on the sideline? Are you watching the game or you want to be a part of it? I believe God's called you to do something. Would you do that today? Would you say, God, I'm going to answer the call today. I'm going to sell out. I'm going to lay aside every sin and everything that hinders me from serving you and I'm going to walk that aisle, Lord, I'm going to give you my life. Would you do that today? These musicians are going to come play. Uh, they're going to come play here in just a moment. Uh, and so as they're making their way, I want, I want to ask you that. What, what, about, what about you today? What has God put on your heart today? You know, it may be that you're sitting here today and you're saying, well, preacher, I know all that stuff you're saying sounds good, but I've never given my life to Christ. You know, the greatest reward you can ever receive, what I say, was Jesus. Can you say without a shadow of a doubt today that if you left this place and you took your last breath, that you'd see Jesus face to face? I hope that you'd say that. And so these musicians are going to come play. This altar's open. And I've got something to ask you. Are you sold out for Christ? Are you like Paul saying, I'm not a boxer flailing wildly. I'm trying to aim every punch for the Lord. Maybe today you need to give something to the Lord. He's called you to do something. He's called you to, to be a leader, to be a teacher, to be a singer. He's called you to do something. 
Would you do that today? Maybe he's called you to salvation. Would you put your faith in Lord Jesus Christ today? We're going to stand, everybody, on your feet. We're going to sing, this altar's open. You come today.